Twitters, you can call me Daddy. And if you want to follow me on Facebook, you can find me at james.desbra, Postmortem Studios, all one word, JD Writer, and JGD Games. PBS has done an article slagging off the OSR, the old school renaissance, and the history of tabletop RPGs. So let's have a look at it. They note the popularity of tabletop, which is what made it comment worthy in the 1980s when it was taking off, and has made it comment worthy now. The pandemic boom and looming bust, elevating the hobby in the public discourse, making more people aware of it, making it even fashionable, trendy, a lifestyle brand. Where the article starts to go off the rails is in saying that gaming is becoming more diverse as though there were ever any real barriers to entry or that women and minorities hadn't been involved since the game's very inception. Yes, the hobby, when it began, was primarily the province of white men. But not wholly. There were women and minorities involved from the very start, and if there was any exclusion, it was not down to gamers, who were positively evangelical about their hobby, but down to societal issues and societal norms beyond the control of gaming. D&D first really took off in universities, and for various reasons, poorer people, and that meant racial minority communities more than anything else, didn't have access to universities, and so were simply not exposed to Dungeons and Dragons. There was hostility within minority cultures, there still is today, it's seen as white people shit, and people are slagged off and treated like shit for participating. There was a streak of anti-intellectualism, and it was seen as an effete, feminine, intellectual pastime. There was more entrenched sexism in the society at large, and while it seems like a contradiction in terms, you know, the game was being dismissed as gay and effeminate, but women at the same time were seeing it as something for sweaty nerds or satanists and and believe me we wanted women to play we tried to sell them on the storytelling aspect of the games you know we wanted women into the hobbies that we were into because yeah we were looking for girlfriends really quite honestly even then one of the people interviewed for this article is talking of both sides of their mouth saying quote people of color and women have always been part of ttrpg culture but actual play shows give them more visibility this is from an alleged expert in male dominated hobbies by the way uh, mr dashiel i mean this whole article gave me kind of a ptsd flashback to the 80s panics the 90s panics and even gamergate where anyone involved might might remember that before running an article on Gamergate, uh, The Guardian consulted with noted drunkard Leigh Alexander uh, to get her take before they published anything, going to one of the people being criticised as corrupt and um, unprofessional to get their take on it rather than even bothering to talk to anyone on the other side of it and this whole article feels very similar it, it's an attack from a public broadcaster that hasn't bothered to get the other side of the story there's there's no fair and balanced here they just uncritically parrot what self-appointed quote-unquote experts say uh, they talk to someone called Iyengar who is apparently known in critical role in streaming circles but not to me an LGBT black woman it was clear from her comments that she was dragging her own baggage to the table and interpreting it as bias or hostility saying that she was comfortable playing the outsider because she'd felt like an outsider all her life that's an argument for games to retain this capability to play someone different but who is compensated statistically for being different in some way having wings and flying being able to breathe fire see in the dark rest without sleeping whatever it might be to be slightly stronger slightly more intelligent slightly quicker whatever it is and that's what seems to be missed here despite being articulated by someone being quoted to support the article 
The article slags off the old school renaissance, characterising it as a movement against outside politics permeating their game space, and the use of traditional fantasy tropes such as good and evil without nuance. I think this is largely a mischaracterization, despite what happened with Troll Lord recently. The OSR certainly wants to retain these things as options. The problem is that this forced politics is permeating the entire hobby, and the use of traditional fantasy tropes is being squeezed out of the entire hobby, and both are being represented as somehow bad, evil, or wrong. We don't want earlier games and gamers to be slagged off and lied about in a way this article does. The article then further disparages the OSR as a white masculine worldview, which isn't even really a thing, I don't think, and as they admitted, doesn't describe gaming since its very inception. This whole article is, ironically, a racist and sexist, reductive way to look at it, using white and male as slander as insults, as pejoratives. Dashiell goes on to zero in on the race issue in D&D, asserting, unbacked, that the races in fantasy games have always been coded to real-world races, with humans being coded as white, and being the most powerful. Untrue on every <laughs> single possible measure, I think humans are represented as adaptable. Um, kind of similarly to the way they are represented in science fiction. In Babylon 5, for example, humans' strength is that they can build communities with things and peoples that aren't like them. I mean, anyone who's tried to build an optimised character will tell you that humans are not the most powerful. <laughs> it should be obvious through the more recent analogy of species that different breeds of being should have different ranges of mathematical capabilities and maths is how most RPGs run. The strongest halfling should probably not be stronger than the weakest giant, for example, to take an extreme. To argue that the different races, different species should not have different capabilities. It's like arguing that a salmon should have an even shot of taking a grizzly bear in a fight and that a grizzly should be as good at swimming as a salmon. These are not human analogues. They are entirely different species, really. Yes, Gygax did describe himself as a biological determinist more than once, or more charitably in modern language that evolution doesn't stop at the neck. He was talking about gender, and that's a third rail topic for another time, though I think I've tackled it in the past. Uh, but here they're trying to paint him as a race realist. They even link to an article he wrote in Dragon, but it doesn't support what they say unless you approach it in an utterly biased manner. The article they linked was talking about fantasy races, you know, species, specifically the half ogre, I think, and the importance of balancing character race capabilities and weaknesses for play. He was not talking about human ethnicities, and he was not saying that there are powerful, meaningful differences between different human ethnicities. Old school level caps were also pointed at, but again that's a matter of balance, not xenophobia. Things like elves were front-loaded with capabilities that made them more powerful earlier on in play, so they were capped as a way of introducing some sort of balance. The whole orc thing is brought up again, and we needn't really retread that bullshit. Suffice to say, Tolkien was a huge influence, and Tolkien's orcs are more akin to demons or devils mythologically than people, and he was so anti-racist, he told the Nazis to fuck off. Orcs in fantasy games tend to be an unquestioned evil for mythic storytelling, which you might dismiss as simplistic or unnuanced, but it is nonetheless powerful, which is why we still talk about Tolkien. We still talk about Greek myths, we still talk about Viking myths, where these things are quite simplistic. The whole article is based on offensive, and more importantly wrong-headed, assumptions about games, gamers, authorial intent, orcs as analogues for black people, elves as Jews, the Hadassi as black and white minstrels, all of this completely unsupported by anything other than the biases of people whose job it is to find or make up biases. It's a lie that these games want everyone to feel welcome and seen, when at the same time there is a constant demonisation of what came before, 
disclaimers on old material when there's nothing racist or sexist or horrible about it. Gaming has always been progressive for its time. They even parade Coyote and Crow, whose marketing and social media activity has been explicitly racist, just against acceptable targets. I'm surprised they didn't parade out swords for. The best hope for diversity and inclusion in games, and well, anything really, is the same as it always was. For gaming, it's, it's a cheap, easy hobby to take part in. It has always been open to anyone and everyone who wanted to play. People didn't want to play in the past. Ironically, this demonization, a new satanic panic within the walls of the hobby, is what is making it less welcoming, both through alienating the core audience and representing the hobby as hostile to outsiders, as racist, sexist, homophobic, all of these other things, when it just simply isn't. Diversity comes through diversity of styles and play, and we're at real risk of becoming a grey, homogenous gaming culture. And ironically, this is coming from people who preach diversity. Zang. Aren't you a little tired of so-called horror media about shiny, sparkly, angsty, whiny monsters? I know I am, and that's why I created Actual Fucking Monsters, where you will play an actual fucking monster doing horrible and monstrous things and being tracked down and killed for it. Buy now at drivethroughrpg, post-mort.com or lulu.com.